If you want to support the platform, just in case anything like this happens again, you can do it by way of PayPal, Patreon, uh, Cash App, and also by um, the Anchor. And you can also further support the platform by way of going to the uh, the Teespring store or um, the shoe store that is located in the comment section below. A century ago, Lynn Johnson was considered as one of the most talented boxers in the world. Throughout the 20s, the Mancunian beat most middleweights in the UK, including two victories over reigning champion Roland Todd. In 1926, he traveled to Australia at the invitation of British Empire belt holder Harry Collins and took what would now be considered the Commonwealth title. But Johnson did not receive the hero's welcome he deserved on his return to the UK because at the time the British Boxing Board of Control had Rule 24, which stated only those born of white parents could fight for a title. Now campaigners in Manchester want Johnson to be recognized with a statue and for his story to be more widely publicized. During his 11-year career, Johnson won 92 of his 127 professional fights, including victories against some of the biggest names in the sport at the time, but he was never allowed to earn a title thanks to boxing's Rule 24, a policy endorsed by then Home Secretary Winston Churchill in 1911 and which stood for almost 40 years until 1947. Deej Malik Johnson, a mixed-race activist from Oldham who was among those supporting the campaign to install a statue, told I it is particularly important because there are few black representatives in positions of power in Manchester. Politically, the lack of representation of Afro-Caribbean people in Manchester speaks loudly while saying nothing. He said, the lack of representation of people from my community, it is completely unjustifiable. Manchester's leadership has been really good at branding. We will talk about Oasis. We will talk about Manchester United. We'll talk about Manchester City. We'll talk about the Hacienda. We'll talk about the Gay Village. But we still aren't talking about the black history of Manchester. We've got a statue of Vimto. We don't have a statue of any black people. At the start of the 20th century, the British establishment feared that the symbol of a black boxer beating his white counterpart might embolden its colonial subjects around the globe and lead to an uprising. Britain and South Africa were the only two countries in the world to enforce the rule and Lynn Johnson had hoped fighting in Australia would give him a loophole. Being stripped of his title led to Johnson becoming disillusioned with the sport and he soon decided it was time to hang up his gloves. According to Michael Herbert's book about him, Never Counted Out, Johnson said in 1930 and barred from the Albert Hall and the National Sporting Club. In fact, whenever there is big money I'm kept out of it, the prejudice against color has prevented me from getting a championship fight. I feel now that there is no use whatever going on with the business. For the rest of his life, Johnson proved to be just as formidable an opponent outside the ring as he was in it. In the 30 seconds, he befriended Paul Robeson, a singer and civil rights campaigner from the U.S., and began championing the cause of communism and anti-colonialism. By the end of the Second World War, Johnson was among delegates hosting the 5th Pan-African Congress in Manchester. Despite millions having died in the name of freedom, the only three nominally independent black countries in 1945 were the republics of Haiti, Ethiopia, and Liberia. The meeting at Charlton on Medlock Town Hall, attended by some of the most famous intellectuals and leaders of the day such as Kenya's Jomo Kenyatta, American academic W. E. B. Du Bois, and the first president of Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah, paved the way for independence in African countries. Johnson was inspiring change closer to home as well. During the war, factory bosses in Greater Manchester had been happy to accept black and Asian laborers on the shop floor. But once peace was declared, many reinstated a so-called color bar, which meant separate queues for white and non-white workers. Johnson rallied against it and many other injustices experienced by people of color. In 1953, he walked into a pub in Greenhees and a state in Moss Side, called the old Abbey Taff House and ordered a round of drinks for some friends but was refused because of the color of his skin. A standoff ensued which led to police being called and over the next three days hundreds of people of all ethnicities joined protests outside the pub. The campaign eventually led to the landlord relenting and Johnson, who was teetotal, being invited to sit down for a drink. Johnson stand helped drive an end to the color bar and other pubs and restaurants, not just across Greater Manchester, but the rest of the country and arguably laid the foundation for what is now the Equalities and Human Rights Commission. Johnson, sporting and political 
technical achievements have led to boxing historians to compare him with the great Muhammad Ali, but despite his achievements, few have heard his story, not least those in the local black community. Mr. Malik Johnson is among those who would like to change that. Back in 2015, I was involved in organizing a Black Lives Matter march in Manchester. He told I, it was much bigger than we expected and we got a few thousand people there. We were looking back asking is this the biggest anti-racist, black-led political thing in Manchester's history? Between us, we had some knowledge of what happened in the 80 seconds and we thought maybe it is. Then one of my friends turns around and says there was this guy Lynn Johnson who had a bigger thing back in 1947. I was flabbergasted thinking how do I not know about this? Why, as a mixed race activist in Manchester am I only just hearing about this story now? In recent years, thousands have signed a petition calling for Lynn Johnson to honor with a statue in his home city of Manchester. The issue gained more prominence in 2020 when protesters began defacing or even pulling down statues linked to slavery. Mayor of Greater Manchester Andy Burnham has publicly stated his support and last year Manchester Council carried out a consultation about which figures should be remembered in its statue monuments and memorials. But there has been little sign of progress since then and Mr. Malik Johnson argues it is time for Manchester's leaders to demonstrate their commitment to honoring the city's black heroes. For a region that likes to describe itself as progressive, there are few in positions of power, from councillors and MPs to police or health bosses, despite the fact that 12% of the population identifies as black. Mr. Malky Johnson hopes that getting recognition for the story of Lynn Johnson might change that in the future. I remember when I was 13 going to Barbados for the first time and seeing black police officers, black politicians, black pilots, black doctors, black business owners, and seeing that made me internalize that I had the ability to be any of those things. He said, that's hugely powerful and it's a message we really need to drill into working class kids in general, kids of color more specifically and black kids even more specifically. It about saying you can do it, you are important, you are of value, your brain is as good as anybody else's, you can change the world and the differences that you want to see are possible. The world Lynn wanted to see will happen but it's going to take its time and we can't get there without remembering what came before. Start the conversation. So this is why, um, you know, looking around and doing research is very much important in order to um, understand that we have other people all around who look just like us, who go through the exact same issues and who have done very great things with the celebrity, the uh, the power with the attention that they have in order to get substantial change to start and or to take place um you know hopefully from a lot of these stories that i will be bringing out um you know people will pay attention to the main uh you know aspects of the story the similarities of the stories and not get so caught up on well is this person really this or if they're really that well they're not really you know us what so doesn't it's nice that it happened but what about us and not but dot 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 like i said if if that's in a sense, you know, all your, you know, innocence looking for, you can very easily find a lot of that information out specifically for yourself if you really wanted to find that information and know um, specifically what took place with those people. Um, I also hope that with a lot of these stories that I'm going to bring forth, that it will, you know, hopefully um, inspire, you know, some people out there. Um, both young and old. It'll make them more knowledgeable about history of, you know, different areas, uh, contributions, um, you know, that have taken place that specifically really don't even get talked about or highlighted at all. And it'll also still show you how racism still affects those individuals, even after they're no longer in existence because again this man should have been honored a very long time ago it, it, it shouldn't take up until now after he's far past gone um for him to in a sense get his flowers for him to get that love that admiration that recognition of what it is that he did and what it is that he was fighting for during that time and this is also another reason why it is that, you know, around, you know, the world, at least those who can see eye to eye need to and should come together in order to benefit, you know, us as 
a whole. Because the more of us that we have, that we can communicate with, that we can share knowledge and history and language and, you know, all of these things, the the better it is for a lot of us, because those are bonds that we will be able to form, right? Um, Those are families that we'll be able to communicate with. Those are, you know, stories that we will be able to share with one another and pass down to our own kids, right? If I know somebody from uh, Zimbabwe or, you know, Ethiopia or, or whatever, and they tell me stories of, you know, their tribe or, you know, their family, different things or, or, or the history of their country. I can tell those stories to my kids because I was able to get first hand knowledge. I, I was told, you know, from a first hand source about this information. So that now enables me to, in a sense, be a library and to pass this down to my kids and they can pass that down and pass that down and pass that down, you know. And again, it's another way that we can formulate bonds so that we can form businesses with one another so that we can formulate our own trades so that we don't have to go through a middleman in order to get what it is that we need. We can come together as a community like, hey, we see that, you know, you have these types of goods or these commodities. We were wondering if we could work with you to sell those here in the United States. We can figure out the numbers and how to, you know, share the profit, however, you know, is is comfortable for everybody. And we can formulate, you know, a business if that is completely fine, you know, with you, if you are willing to work with us. Like I said, I, I see it as a very beneficial um <laughs> I said beneficial. I see it as a very beneficial um, thing, you know, that can happen. Like I said, I'm, I'm just I'm just looking at the positive. I'm looking at all the positive that is around. I'm looking at 2023 as the start to a very uh, positive, uh, blessed, lucrative, um, you know, type of type of thing for, you know, the black community. So. Yeah.